Hello my dears, uh, we're looking at the wrath of God this week, so before I say anything else, let me pray. Our Father in heaven, uh, as we think about this sobering and difficult subject, we pray you'd be with us by your spirit, helping us to accept the truths of your word, uh, spurring us on to tell a needy lost world about these truths that the wrath of God is coming uh, but also of course um, ready to proclaim the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ that whoever believes in the son is no longer condemned and no longer facing wrath um, but looking at eternal life and joy instead we ask this in Jesus name amen as I said, the wrath of God this week, obviously a sobering and um, serious topic. Um, deliberately doing it this week after we had the love of God last week. <clears throat> By the way, this bin bag here, that's not full of rubbish. I'm not that disgusting. Just putting that out there. This is a topic that needs to be understood and um, and proclaimed, doesn't it, to the world, along with the answer, which I mentioned in the prayer just then, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, we don't just want to leave people with wrath. We want to give them grace as well. I'm not going to get all academic about this, hopefully. Um, so if you want to dig into God's future wrath on that last day and God's wrath that's being poured out now in Romans 1 and kind of what wrath is exactly in the Bible and what the words mean, um, I can recommend some books and stuff for you if you want, but for today, I wanted the video to end with hope, as the Bible does, because um, wrath should never be the last word for us. Um, so I hope you'll forgive me for kind of deviating from the normal structure just for this video. Uh, and this might be a bit more sermony than normal, but I think that the subject matter demands it. And uh, I hope I've got that right. So to help us, we're going to run with an image that the Bible uses, which is a cup, uh, the cup of God's wrath. Um, and uh, that's an image that's used in the Old and the New Testament. I've got some examples. Psalm 75, for a cup is in the hand of the Lord and the wine foams. It is well mixed and he pours out of this. Surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its dregs. Jeremiah 25, for thus the Lord, the God of Israel, says to me, take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And Revelation uh, 14, I think I've not written it down. He will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And then later on, Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. So the cup of the wrath of God in scripture is for the wicked, for sinners, for those who rebel. And we should know, first of all, that this wrath is not God's default state, as if he's some angry deity who is just uh, naturally, permanently looking for someone to smash up. Um, no, God has to be provoked to wrath. Um, in the Old Testament, God is provoked to wrath many, many times <laughs> by his people and the nations around. His anger is kindled, it says, but not once is he provoked to love. Why is that? Well, it's because he's always so ready to love. His wrath needs to be provoked. He needs to be poked and poked and mocked and mocked until he gets angry. But love, well, you can have that for free. Um. God is love. And as he says in Exodus, he is uh, the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger. But back to the cup of wrath that we were talking about. What's in it? What is God's wrath then? Um, well, the first thing to say is that God's wrath is not like my wrath or your wrath. There's a huge difference, thankfully, between God's wrath and mine. Uh, we've already said many times in these videos that God is not like us, and that's a good thing. Uh, so just like his love is not like my love, his wrath is not like my wrath. His wrath is always justified and it's holy. My wrath is rarely, rarely justified and not very holy at all. And incidentally, that's why we leave wrath to God and vengeance to God. We are to repay with love. Uh, we're not to give vent to our wrath and we're to leave it to him. In fact, we're to get rid of our wrath. 
that God's wrath is completely just and settled and righteous anger against sin and wickedness. And Jim Packer says it is a right and necessary reaction to objective moral evil. Right and necessary. Imagine on TV tomorrow you heard that a celebrity had been using their status and power to rape children. Would you be angry? Yes. Would God be angry? Well, I flipping hope so. <laughs> Would we expect God to be angry? What sort of God is not angry at such abhorrent destruction of innocence and betrayal of trust? No, the God who is love, light and uh, moral purity would be righteously angry at that behaviour. And the problem comes because sin dwells in all of our hearts and God is angry at sin. So when we speak about God's righteous uh, wrath against the rapist, we need to speak of God's righteous wrath against us as well, because we are sinners. Uh, at least before we bring Christ into the equation, which we will do. <laughs> Paul says in Ephesians 2 that by nature we are all objects of wrath. Uh, the cup has our name on it. We all naturally deserve to drain it. You can't get away from that in the Bible. We must know that and we must accept it for the gospel to mean anything. Uh, for there to be any urgency in our proclamation of the good news at all. So that's what God's wrath is and who it's directed against. And I'm aware I've already spoken for six minutes. Um, I try not to speak for too long, but it's, it's an important subject, isn't it? Where is the good news this week? Well, let's read Matthew 26. Let me just get it because um, I haven't <laughs> already got it ready. Let's read Matthew 26, and you can find it as well while I'm looking, from verse 36. Okay, Matthew 26, from 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit there while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled, and he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther off, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. We've got Jesus going to Gethsemane there with his disciples. And he says, you stay there, I'm off to pray, because he knows what's coming and he needs to be with his father. And he says, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken away. And now we know what the cup is because we've been talking about it. Jesus comes to Gethsemane to pray, calls out to his father and sees the cup of God's wrath. Which makes the nation stagger, which brings disgrace and shame and torment. The cup that's waiting in his father's hands for Jesus to drain it to the dregs in just a few hours. Jesus is facing hell for those that he loves who actually can't even stay awake, we find out. Uh, and pray with him. Fiery torment, eternal punishment, outer darkness, gnashing of teeth, fire and sulphur, just some of the words Jesus uses to describe this place, uh, this, this separation from God. Is it any wonder that he's horrified? He's horrified to the point of praying that if there's any other way, let the cup pass from him. This is his whole mission on earth. But he's praying if there's any other way, let it be that way. We can't imagine. Um, and yet he says, not my will, but yours be done. Three times Jesus prays and three times he sees the cup of God's wrath overflowing in front of him. And three times he commits in obedience to his father. And we know the story. Jesus is arrested and tried. He's mocked. He's spat upon. He's flogged until his skin hangs off. He's dressed as a cruel parody of a king he's nailed to the cross and he slowly begins to suffocate but the physical pain agonizing and unimaginable though it is is still nothing compared to the abyss that opens before jesus as he accepts the cup of god's wrath for my sin and prepares to drink and don't you dare think this is too much or that this is harsh. God is just. God does not punish people more than they deserve. 
And so if we don't think when we see the greatness of the punishment that God is being unfair, surely we think, how black must my heart be that the Saviour had to go through this? But as we understand something of the depravity that lives in my heart and yours um, and the weight of punishment it deserves, we also see the beauty of the cross of Christ, don't we? And the love it must take for the Son to willingly endure it for us. As he died, the sky went dark, tombs opened, the earth quakes, like creation went into spasm at the abhorrence of what had just happened. The creature killing the creator, the king, and laughing as they did it. But of course, it was meant to happen. That was the plan all along. Jesus came to drink my cup and your cup, the cup of wrath that was full to the brim with the sins of all God's people now and forever. He came to drink it right down so that there was nothing left, nothing left for us to drink. He came, as Paul writes to the Thessalonians, to deliver us from the wrath to come. As Stuart Townend wrote, Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Now, some people kick off about that line, don't they? They prefer to sing the love of God was magnified. And to them, I'd like to say, get over yourself, grow up. The wrath of God was satisfied at the cross. And hallelujah. <laughs> no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because the Saviour drank it all. There's nothing left. And But of course, some don't believe and you know what that means. The cup is still theirs. It's got their name on it and nobody else is going to drink it for them. Whoever believes in the Son, John writes, has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You and I have friends and family in that very situation. So what are we doing about it? <laughs> We're praying, aren't we? We're praying. You're nodding. I hope you're nodding. We're praying for those people. We're talking to people, telling them the good news of Jesus any way we can, giving them a chance to hear, aren't we? You're still nodding with me, aren't you? We're giving our money to the church to facilitate gospel preaching so that Cheeto can hear, aren't we? You're still nodding along with me, I hope. What are we doing about the billions of lost souls in the world sitting under the wrath of a holy God what are we doing about the lost souls next door? In the end, salvation belongs to the Lord. Some of us are in situations where we've prayed and prayed and done everything we can. And that person or those people are just not coming to Christ. Yet, they may do, they may not. So this isn't a guilt trip like you haven't done enough. But let's never use the fact that salvation belongs to the Lord as an excuse to get lazy. Charles Spurgeon, a great old preacher, said, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let no one go unwarned and unprayed for. The day is coming when the choice to turn to Christ will be removed for so many around us, and the wrath of God will come. It's not fire and brimstone preaching to say that, it's just true. God, forgive us our dullness to this in so much of the Western church. If that isn't motivation <laughs> to do our jobs as Christians, then I don't know what is. Let's finish on Psalm 7. <clears throat> o Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me, lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces with none to deliver. 
O oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil, or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, and let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Arise, O oh Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me, you have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it return on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end. May you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. I'm not going to tag a song on to the end this week because the song I want, I don't have permission to put on YouTube, so I'm just going to put it in the comments instead. Um, obviously, this is really serious, and um, in 15 minutes I'm not going to be able to sort it all out. And this might have upset you. Fully understand that. So if it has, um, don't be afraid to get in touch and tell me. Um, speak to someone. Speak to me. That's fine. Uh, the wrath of God is real. We need to know about it. But that doesn't mean it's not upsetting. Uh, let me pray just one more time. Our Father, thank you that in your kindness, you tell us that your wrath is coming. And you give us a way of escape. In your kindness, you save some through your son, by your grace. We pray that you'd help us not only to accept this, but to rejoice in your kindness and love. That is impossible to do without the help of your spirit. Yeah. So, Father, we pray you'd have mercy on us and help us to do that. And we pray, Lord, that you'd have mercy on those who we've thought of as we've talked about your wrath, those upon whom your wrath remains, as far as we know. Have mercy on them and add them to our number. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.